Welcome back, everyone. Today on the Joseph Carlson Show, Apple is countersuing Fortnite. So this is a turn in events. Epic Games, which is a creator of Fortnite, obviously has caused this big public war with Apple, this big public debate over the App Store and the policies. But now Apple's actually going on the offensive and they're countersuing Epic Games seeking punitive damages. So this is something interesting to see Apple do. We'll be going over this news. We also have news that Warren Buffett bought an IPO, which is something he doesn't usually do, as well as the IPO of a tech company and a very difficult to understand tech company. This isn't one like Apple that just sells phones or Amazon that has a public marketplace. Snowflake is a data company. It's a cloud hosting data company that offers a bunch of different tools on storing and manipulating data for companies. It's very difficult for the average person to wrap their head around what Snowflake even does. Even engineers will take some time to learn about all the tools this company has. So Warren Buffett investing in it is a surprise to many, but I see this as becoming a trend where Warren Buffett really isn't the one, I believe, leading these investments. So we're going to be talking about Snowflake, what I think this means of the future of Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett's investments. And then we have the headline news of the week, which is Nikola, this zero emissions car company. It's under an incredible amount of scrutiny right now, along with its founder, Trevor Milton, because Hindenburg Research came out with an extensive write-up alleging that Nikola was participating in fraud. And this is the type of fraud where it's basically alleging that they duped investors into investing in their company, that they have been highly deceptive, that they not only have made uh, bad promises to investors, but they've made false statements, that they've lied about their technology, and that investors have invested in them based off of false pretenses. So these allegations are serious allegations that both would have reputational implications as well as legal implications. So we're going to be looking over this research paper. It's about 20 or 30 pages long. I read through all of it. Uh, We won't go over all of it, but I, I picked out what I think are the two most damning claims that Hindenburg Research brings up against Nikola. There's two claims in particular that if they're true, I think it would be fraudulent activity by Nicholas. So uh, we're going to look at those allegations, look at those claims. I'm going to give my thoughts on this situation overall. So we'll be talking about this as well. And then, of course, we have my portfolio on M1 Finance. This is a dividend growth portfolio. I'll be going over the different purchases that I've done over the previous week, as well as ones I plan to do in the future. So we have all of that to get to, uh, as well as emails and questions at the end of the episode. Before we get into any of that, I have to mention the All Access Tier Patreon membership is six bucks a month. If you join now, you'll get the next couple of weeks for free. So you get charged at the beginning of next month. So you'll be able to enjoy it for free for a few weeks. See if it's something you enjoy. We've had hundreds of members join over just the past couple of days. So I appreciate meeting everybody new. It basically gives you access to a bunch of exclusive content, a community discord where we discuss investing every day, a dividend track tracking website and a bunch of other stuff. So you can try that out. There's a link in the description if you're interested in that. All right, guys, I have to jump in here. This is a day later after recording this episode. I originally recorded it Sunday evening. So that's when I originally recorded this whole Nikola segment going over their claims. But here we are Monday morning and Nikola responded to the claims. So what I want to do in this episode is I'm going to play the original part that I had, my original thoughts on the subject before Nikola responds. And then I'm going to go ahead and and give you my take after reading Nicola's response. So here we go. This is what I recorded Sunday evening. Okay, now let's jump into the headline news, which is the company Nicola is basically being charged with fraud by the court of public opinion. Most people that I've talked to think that they've been committing fraud. That's the side that most people are on. In fact, I did a community poll on my YouTube. If you're subscribed to the channel, you'll see these show up on your YouTube homepage. Mine said, is Nicola a fraud? That was the question. Is Nikola fraud? Yes or no. Very basic. Nothing else with it. There was 5,800 votes so far from just one day ago. And 78% of you said that Nikola is a fraud, which leaves 22% saying, no, it's not. I read through some of the comments and people are saying the reasons why it is and why it's not. But that is a a pretty good sample size. About 6,000 people being sampled there and 78% believing that Nikola is a fraud. My channel is also not full of, I think, uh, Tesla fanboys, right? This isn't a Tesla YouTube channel. There's some YouTube channels where they come out with Tesla content nonstop, and most of their viewers are investors and fans of Tesla, so they'd be naturally kind of against Nikola. That's not this YouTube channel. So most of the people viewing this, I don't think are Tesla fanboys. Some of them might be, but I don't think all of them are. I think that this is a pretty accurate sample size of just the broader opinion on this subject. And having almost 80% of people think that Nikola is a fraud is 
concerning to say the very least if you're somebody associated with Nikola. That is not good to have in the court of public opinion. Now, nothing's been proven, but the allegations are extremely serious, and I want to stress that. When I look at allegations that people throw around online, people like to say all sorts of extremely serious allegations, and a lot of times they don't really give second thought to it. They will say somebody is a fraud without having too much evidence of it. And I think that that's wrong. When you have somebody that you're claiming that they're fraudulent, you're basically calling them a liar, a deceiver, and somebody that has uh, monetarily benefited from that deceit. That is a, a serious allegation. So when I look at these type of allegations that Hindenburg Research is alleging that Nikola is committing, I look at it as a very serious thing. Saying that they are fraudulent and they're deceptive is about as bad as it can get for a company. That's basically saying that you're stealing from investors. You're getting their money based off of false pretenses. That type of fraud is extremely serious. So with that being said, I try to look at this from the viewpoint of Trevor Milton, from the viewpoint of Nikola, and I try to give them somewhat of the benefit of the doubt going in. That most people are against them, but I really want to see their side of it along with the allegations. So the first thing I'll say is a lot of this article reading through it was focused on things that are not fraudulent, but just bad business. For instance, it highlights a couple of them that are like, uh, I can find one here. It says, Trevor has appointed his brother Travis as, quote, director of hydrogen production infrastructure to oversee critical parts of the business. Travis's prior experience looks to have largely consisted of pouring concrete driveways and doing subcontractor work on home renovations in Hawaii. The reason that it highlights this is to say that Trevor picked his brother for this highly scientific role, director of hydrogen production and infrastructure. Typically, you'd see somebody that's highly experienced in some type of scientific role to deal with that type of, of role in a company. But Trevor had his little brother do it. And his little brother doesn't have any experience doing that. He has experience doing concrete work in, in Hawaii. And Hindenburg Research is highlighting this to show you know, the, that they're doing silly stuff like this. But this is not fraudulent. There's nothing fraudulent about putting somebody in a role that they're not really equipped for. And that happens all the time in business. And I think that people are pretty three-dimensional. Sometimes people can take on roles that they really have no experience doing. So this in and of itself, even though it highlights Nikola in a bad light, even though it tries to paint them as this immature company that he's getting his little brother to do this big role that it should have somebody with, with a lot of background doing, it's not fraud. This isn't fraud. So pointing this out isn't illegal. Having Trevor put his little brother in a role that he's really not uh, equipped for in terms of his experience is not illegal. So when I look at that, I have to give them the benefit of the doubt and say, that's great you bring them up Hindenburg Research. That's fine that you point that out, but that's basically just a bear case. You're saying just don't invest in this company because they're not running it well. That's not the same as saying that they're doing something fraudulent. So there's a lot of claims like this that aren't necessarily fraudulent, but they are, in my opinion, questionable business tactics. The big subject that this article starts off on is Trevor Milton. He's the founder of the company. He's the executive chairman of it. He's basically running it from the media standpoint. He's on Twitter all the time, and he kind of runs his Twitter like Elon Musk, saying all sorts of stuff. He uses the F word on Twitter. He will kind of like self-censor it. That's the type of personality that he has. I think Trevor Milton has tried to mold himself into somewhat of the uh, eccentric type of CEO that Elon Musk is. They both have zero emission vehicles. That's their that's their business. And now Trevor's kind of emulating Elon Musk in a way. So that's the person that this article focuses a lot on. Now I'll say one of the things that I remember reading about Trevor Milton when I first read about him running Nikola was that as soon as his company became public and it got a lot of investors money, he cashed out $70 million of stock and bought a mansion, a record-breaking mansion in Utah that cost $32.5 million. It's this enormous ranch. And I looked at this, and again, this is something that like putting your little brother in some very scientific role when he's not really qualified for it, this is something that is not illegal. It's not illegal to put a company that's publicly traded, have a lot of investors pour money into it, raise the stock price, and then cash out a bunch of money and build yourself a mansion. That's not illegal to do, but it does bring up some concerns as an investor. That as soon as he's given any type of money, an investor's money in his company, what he does is build himself a mansion. That's not really a good decision, I think, in terms of perception. If you're trying to control how people perceive you, how they're gonna judge you as a company owner, 
the first thing that you do is buy a mansion instead of make your company productive and actually sell vehicles, I think you're going to get criticism for that. So this is somebody to me that strikes me as someone that does not care about how he's perceived. He just doesn't care about it because he's doing things that are going to get him a wide amount of criticism. Even though this isn't illegal, a lot of investors will look at this and say, my goodness, I'm putting money into this company. They haven't sold a single car. And the first thing he does is buy a giant $32 million mansion. Is that really the person I want running the company I'm investing in? The only profit so far that the company Nikola has made is selling solar panels to this home. That's the only money the company has made so far. And that was, again, something that got written up as headlines of different articles that made the news that Nikola's entire quarterly revenue of $36,000 was from solar installation for the executive chairman for his new ranch that he, that he purchased. These aren't good write-ups. This isn't the news headlines that you want. It says right here that tech founders are often accused of being overly rosy with their projections. Supporters credit the founders of having bold, forward-thinking plans, while detractors accuse them of knowingly selling unrealistic promises. While such debates among optimists and pessimists are common, most everyone can agree that there's a difference between being overly optimistic about the future and outright lying. So what they're basically saying that Nikola has done and Trevor Milton has done is not just made big, bold promises and big, bold future goals, but they've lied about their current technology. They've lied about things of the past, things of the current, things that they're doing right now that they've been deceptive of. That's what this paper is alleging that they do. And throughout all of it, the two biggest claims of this, I believe, are their demonstrations. The first demonstration is this YouTube video right here that's about 40 seconds long. It's a demonstration of the Nikola 1 truck driving down a road. That's all it is. It's just the Nikola 1 truck driving down a road. And keep in mind, Hindenburg Research is claiming that this demonstration that we're about to watch is a giant fraud. This is all it is. It's just the Nikola 1 driving on this road. It goes on, but that's really all it is. It's just the truck driving on a road. Did you see the big fraud in that video? Did the fraudulent activity stick out to you? Maybe not, but let's go ahead and take a look at what Hindenburg says. In 2018, in order to continue the appearance of progress, Nikola posted a YouTube video of its Nikola 1, quote, in motion on the road. Text messages from a former employee revealed that the truck was simply filmed rolling down a big hill. That's what they, they claim the video was, that that truck that you just saw in that clip was not driving by itself, it was gravity that was propelling it. Basically, they're saying that the fraud here was that Nikola deceived people into believing that truck was driving when in fact it was gravity propelling it down the hill. Now, if we look further into this claim, it says that Nikola had a time period where they were falling behind on their Nikola 1. To remedy this hype gap, Nikola teased a tweet on October 6, 2017, about an upcoming video. The tweet says, you may or may not see the Nikola truck moving in a commercial soon. And then it goes on to explain that the Nikola One in Motion video, which we just watched, released the next day on Nikola's corporate YouTube account and was promoted on social media, garnering 230,000 views on Facebook alone. This video appeared to show the truck driving on a level road at a high rate of speed. It shows a clip here from another tweet they did. Behold the Nikola One in motion with the same video attached to it. It says the video generated a tremendous amount of buzz and excitement about the pre-production units to be released the following year, which never happened. But according to a former employee who spoke with Nikola chief engineer, Kevin Link, the video was simply the result of Nikola towing the truck to the top of a hill and rolling it down. And they have the text message conversation of this, that it was a low grade hill. The section of road is lightly used and features a two mile long, perfectly straight stretch and enough slope to get a motorless truck rolling. There were no features in the shot that would betray the slope, so the camera could be positioned at an angle that would make the road appear fairly level or at times even uphill. And it shows a screenshot of the video portraying it as if the truck's moving uphill when they're saying it was a downhill slope. Now Hindenburg went as far as to actually test this themselves. They say an investigator sent to the exact site used by Nikola for their video tested the hill in an SUV by parking the vehicle at the top, then rolling from neutral. He was able to hit a top speed of 56 miles an hour, and he rolled approximately 2.1 miles. So they got a car from neutral to go 56 miles an hour down this hill, uh, kind of proving that they could do the same thing with a truck. So this, I think, is the biggest allegation in this entire research paper. And the reason this is important, you might look at this as like a commercial, but this isn't a commercial. 
This is a demonstration of technology that this truck can do things that it really can't. And what made me most skeptical of all of this, what made me actually believe Hindenburg and be kind of on their side without even knowing what the truth is, I'm inclined to believe Hindenburg on this for one reason, and that is the phrasing that every one of these titles has. Nikola Motor Company, the Nikola One electric semi-truck in motion. Why does it always say in motion? In the title, it says in motion. Uh, in the description, it says in motion. It never says driving. It never says in operation. It says in motion. And I think the reason that Nikola would do this is some kind of attempt to be technically correct. Technically, the truck was in motion. It was moving, but it wasn't propelling itself. If they said that it was driving, then they would be claiming that it was propelling itself. If they say that it was in operation, they'd be claiming that it was in operation by itself. But saying that it's in motion could mean it's just in motion because it's moving. And they're not lying because technically it's moving. They didn't only say this on the YouTube video in the title. They didn't only say it in the description. They also use the exact same wording on both tweets. Behold the Nikola one in motion. And the first tweet, they say again, you may or may not see the Nikola truck moving in a commercial soon. They don't say driving. They don't say operating. They say moving in motion and moving. That makes me very skeptical. I don't know why they would consistently label it in motion and be so careful not to ever say our truck is driving. It's operational. They don't say that anywhere. They just claim that it's in motion. Now, let me say on this note that if Nikola really had this truck that wasn't operational, that couldn't drive by itself, and they rolled it down a hill, and then they created this big production called the Nikola One in Motion, and they, they illustrated it as if their vehicle could drive by itself, showing it going on this seemingly flat road, that would be incredibly deceptive. I think that would constitute fraud, in my opinion. Uh, you can't deliberately mislead investors. Whether or not you're technically telling the truth, saying that it's in motion, the thing that investors are going to gather from this is that the truck is operational. That's what this video shows, is it shows it driving. So these kind of games of saying that it's in motion rather than driving is not a good defense. If they really didn't have this truck working and they rolled it down a hill, that would be incredibly deceptive. Okay, we're back. That is the section of video that I recorded Sunday evening before Nikola came out with this response. Now we have CNBC reporting that Nikola, they're rebutting a lot of the claims, but they admitted that that's exactly what they did in that video. That they carefully worded the, the certain semantics that it was in motion, but it wasn't driving as a fallback for if they got exposed for that complete deceptive video that they manufactured, if it got exposed, they have their technicality to fall back on. This is so unbelievably deceptive I cannot believe people would put their money in a company that would intentionally craft a video or an entire production like that, which the sole purpose of it is to deceive investors. That's the purpose of it. And then their defense is, is this. This is their defense. Regarding the video, Nicholas said, quote, it never stated the truck was driving under its own propulsion in the video, although the truck was designed to do that. Oh, we never said it was driving. We were technically correct. We played the right wordsmithing and, and had the right semantics in the video, even though the video itself was definitely intentionally misleading people. They say here, quote, it was never described as under its own propulsion or powertrain driven. The company said, Nikola said the investors at the time knew the capabilities of the prototype vehicle, calling the third year old video, quote, irrelevant, except for the fact that short seller is trying to use it for its main thesis. No, people clearly did not know the technology of the truck at the time. Do you know how I know that investors weren't aware of the technology of this truck at the time of this video? Because the comments, many of the comments on this video, two years old, were people saying, wow, that's cool to see this truck driving. Many of them got the impression that the truck was driving because that's the impression that the video led people to believe. And guess what Nikola did? They turned comments off on this video so that they, again, won't be exposed for intentionally misleading investors. This is incredibly deceptive stuff to see a company do. To come out with this production, to carefully play this whole semantic game of saying it's in motion, you know, we, we see it in motion, people naturally are going to believe that it's driving. And then they film it in a way where it clearly looks like the truck is driving. And then their fallback defense is we never stated the truck is driving under its own propulsion in the video. 
Guys, I don't know how you get more deceptive than this. This is a completely pathetic defense. They intentionally misled investors, and investors were not aware of the capabilities of the prototype vehicle. If you want to show that, turn back on the comments of your video, and you'll see hundreds of comments of people that are completely unaware because your video misled them. So there you have it. This is Nikola's defense. We played this semantic word game. Now we got caught by Hindenburg Research and we're falling back on, on the technicality of saying that it was in motion rather than driving. What a way to run a company. So I think it goes without saying that I would not invest a dime in a Nikola. I think this company's untrustworthy. I think it's sad that GM just did an agreement with them because this company admitted to the biggest claim that Hindenburg had that they intentionally misled investors by towing a truck to the top of a hill, rolling it down, and then filming it in a way as though it was driving itself. That is incredibly deceiving. I think it should be investigated by the SEC for intentionally misleading investors. And the comments, by the way, were turned on yesterday. When I was making the video yesterday, the comments were on, many of them were from 2018, and a lot of those comments were excited about the technology of the truck that didn't exist. They were people that were misled by the production of this video. So I think the whole in motion thing is a completely weak response. So uh, that's my thoughts on it. I would not invest in Nikola. I think the company is very untrustworthy. I would never do business with them. Now, moving on, we have the news that Warren Buffett spent $570 million on a bet on Snowflake, which is a tech company that's IPOing soon that is a cloud data warehouse company. These type of headlines, though, I think they just got to go. We got to get rid of these type of headlines that Warren Buffett bought this and Warren Buffett bought that. Warren Buffett didn't buy Snowflake. I can almost guarantee you that. Now, this is on Market Insider. If we look at another Market Insider article, this one says that Warren Buffett's $570 million bet on Snowflake shows he completely trusts his deputies, investor Jake Taylor says. This is a correct headline. Warren Buffett is now showing that he trusts his deputies to make investment choices without him really knowing the company in and of itself. I strongly believe that Warren Buffett has no clue what Snowflake really does, how it works, how it interacts with anything, and that the decision to invest in this company before the IPO was basically based off of Todd Combs or Ted Weschler, which are the two portfolio managers at Berkshire. It wasn't Warren Buffett that invested in this. So, these articles that continually say Warren Buffett bought this or Warren Buffett bought that, you can look at the type of purchase and see if it's one that you think that Warren Buffett would buy. Snowflake is definitely not one of them. This is so far out of the realm of Warren Buffett's circle of competence. I don't think that he would allocate a penny of this to himself, let alone over half a billion dollars. This company is more technical than most tech companies. So when you think of tech companies, you think of Facebook, you think of Amazon, maybe Netflix, uh, you think of Apple. Those are tech companies, but we really can use the products. We can go onto facebook.com and see what we're buying, see the type of experience that we're buying. With Apple, you can use their phones and see what products you're purchasing when you buy their stock. And likewise with Amazon, you can see that they have the online marketplace, they have Amazon Prime. You can see the offerings that they have. Snowflake is a lot more difficult for people that aren't working directly with this application to understand the value that it brings to companies. And I don't think Warren Buffett has a clue of what this company really does how it really works and helps different companies. I think this is entirely the result of other people at Berkshire that have done analysis on this company. Now, in terms of what Snowflake actually does, it is a data warehouse company. So you take all the information of your company that you need to store and you use Snowflake as a service to be able to store that information. It takes it from all different various sources. It normalizes the data. It lets you duplicate it and run tests on it. It lets you do uh, different analytics on it. It lets you plug in different plugins with it and use the information any way you want. That's basically what the company does, which is a big offering from one company. I've never used Snowflake myself. I've never used it hands-on, but I have done a lot of research about it. Literally everything I read about it online, everything I hear about it in person of people that have used it is overwhelmingly positive. Most people have an extremely good experience using Snowflake. They recommend it to other people. They say that it's a great tool that if your company's deciding what to switch to, they usually highly recommend it. So it does seem like from the secondhand impressions I get that this company does have a pretty good offering. Now, if we dig into the numbers on this company, the growth of it has been pretty incredible. It says in the fiscal year ending in January 31st, 2019, Snowflake had a revenue of 96 million. A year later, that number was 264.7 million, or growth of around 150% at scale. 
In the six months ending July 31st, 2019, Snowflake's revenue was $104 million. A year later, those two quarters generated revenues of $242 million. That's a growth of 132% on a year-over-year basis. So this company is growing rapidly. The revenue year-over-year is over 100%. And meanwhile, the margins on that revenue continues to increase. In 2019, it was 46%. In 2020, it was 56%. The company in this stage is not currently profitable. It says in the six months ending July 31st, 2019, the company's net loss was $177.2 million. In the same two quarters of this year, it was slightly lower at $171.3 million. So the company's losing money, but the losses aren't accelerating and the revenue gain and the margins are accelerating. So Snowflake, at least based off these numbers, is growing rapidly. Snowflake's IPO value is estimated to be around 24 billion. I think it will actually end up being higher than that. I think the company will race up pretty quickly, given the fact that both Berkshire and Salesforce have validated this company. They've both taken investments in this company as early as possible. So to me, it has all the catalysts. It has all the right ingredients to be one of those companies that really takes off. It has rapidly growing revenue. It's in the hot sector, which is cloud. It's a cloud data company, which is what everybody wants to invest in right now. And then on top of that, it has Salesforce and Berkshire both investing in it. All of those factors together makes me believe this is one stock a lot of people are going to want to own. Now, this company doesn't belong in my passive income dividend portfolio, but if I was looking for a good holding in a growth portfolio, I think this company is really appealing. At least in my opinion, a company that offers this type of services that reduces a lot of pain points, that both has validation from Salesforce and Berkshire, that integrates with Azure and AWS, this is a company I think has a lot of potential. So this is one that I would look at. I would look at the valuation right now, 24 billion is expensive. I think it will race up a little bit beyond that, but I do think this is the type of company that will continue to grow pretty rapidly. Now, the other bit of news I wanted to check in on, see how it's going, is the old Apple and Epic Games dispute. This has been going on for a while. We all know what happened. Epic Games, they bypassed Apple systems and ensued this entire battle between Epic Games, Fortnite, and Apple. And here we are with Apple actually taking the step of countersuing Fortnite, not something that they typically do. From the Wall Street Journal, it says that in court documents filed Tuesday, Apple defended its actions and went further, asking a federal judge in California to award punitive damages and restrict Epic Games from continuing what it describes as unfair business practices. Apple says, quote, Epic's lawsuit is nothing more than a basic disagreement over money. Although Epic portrays itself as a modern corporate Robin Hood, in reality, it's a multi-billion dollar enterprise that simply wants to pay nothing for the tremendous value it derives from the App Store. So Epic Games and Apple are now suing each other. Apple is suing for punitive damages because Epic Games circumvented their payment solution, and Epic Games is suing Apple to have their game Fortnite put back in the App Store. Both of them are suing each other for different reasons. Now, I think the reason that Epic Games really wants Fortnite to be reinstated back in the App Store is because they're suffering a little bit more damages than they thought they would. The amount of reduction in players since the new downloads of Fortnite was removed, it's gone down 60%. The player base has gone down 60% on iOS. That is an enormous drop. Epic Games has described that as irreparable harm to their business. So they're asking the courts to reinstate Fortnite to the App Store. So the courts have a lot to decide. They have two multi-billion dollar companies suing each other and claiming different things and arguing different things. And some judge has to decide what happens. So I'll keep you up to date with this story. We'll see what the judges eventually decide. Okay, now before we get into emails and questions, I wanna do a quick portfolio update. This is the passive income dividend growth portfolio on M1 Finance. There's a link in the description if you wanna click around and see what companies I invest in. You can look at that for free. But basically, every single company in this portfolio pays a dividend. They all pay on different schedules. So some months I get a lot more dividends than others, but I just kind of average it out over the year. For instance, in the past 30 days, I've earned $282 in dividends. That's how much I've earned. That's going to be paid later. That'll go in the cash balance. I'll be able to pick what companies I want to buy with that money. And that just happens all the time. Like I have $16.74 sitting here. I didn't deposit this. This is just from dividends. If I go to my activity feed here, you can see that I get these dividends all the time. And some of them are, are pretty decent amounts. JP Morgan paid $51. AT&T paid $90. 
Uh, I have Apple paying $36 in dividends and so on and so forth. I get these all the time and they roll back into the portfolio. So that's the basic premise of this portfolio is to have it provide a stream of cash flow that I can reinvest back into different companies and build up different holdings with. Now, one company that I've been investing in a lot over the past week was the company I talked about in the previous video, which is Store Capital. Store Capital is ran by a guy named Christopher Volk who I think is kind of the opposite of what the allegations are against Nicholas founder Trevor Milton. Christopher Volk is very transparent. He's very honest in what he's doing. He keeps investors in the loop of everything that's going on. And I really appreciate his transparency. And I think that he's extremely competent in his leadership. So that's part of the reason that I'm investing in this company. I like the business plan on top of that. And I like the income the, the holding provides. But I now have about value of $11,200 in it. I'm up $851 right now, but I just invested quite a bit over the past week. I have currently 405 shares of store capital, and I'm going to continue to grow this holding. And right now that makes it the second biggest position in my portfolio underneath Apple. So I think I have a good mix here of my top holdings. I have Apple, store capital, Disney, JP Morgan, AT&T, and I've also been building up Costco. That's another company that does not pay a big dividend, it's kind of an expensive company, but if you're a longtime follower of this show, you'll know that Costco is one of my favorite all-time companies. It's a weird mix of retail plus subscription service, and it's a dividend-paying company. It just has a lot of ingredients that I like in one holding, so I'm building up my Costco holding as well. But this is the portfolio right now. Just wanted to give the update. I bought a lot of shares of store capital, probably about five, 6000 over the past week. So the current share count is 405 that means that this holding in and of itself should provide over $500 a year in dividends just by itself. So it should be a good income stream. It pays out once a quarter, and I'm going to enjoy getting that income and being able to reinvest it back into the portfolio. Okay, let's move on to some emails. The first one is from B. He says, Joseph, I've been a longtime holder of General Electric. I have about 6,000 shares. Because I inherited these shares, I felt guilt when considering to sell. But this is no longer the case. I've lost considerable time and money watching these shares decline while other companies turn a profit. I'm now planning to immediately unload my shares and purchase more profitable companies. But do you think I should hang on to some of my GE? Since GE is so low right now, what would you do? My cost basis is $3.16 per share, and today they trade around $6. Okay, B, a couple things. First, don't feel guilty at all about selling your GE shares. If you start to feel guilty about it and think, I inherited it, just think, Joseph told me I don't have to feel guilty about this. So have that in the back of your head. If you ever feel guilty about it, I'm telling you, you don't have to. Whoever gave you these shares, whoever you inherited them from, I promise you they did it to enrich your life, to give you a productive asset that's going to give you some financial benefit. So that was the purpose of it. They're not saying you have to keep GE in particular. They wanted to give you a productive asset. And I'm sure if they saw that you were selling out of GE to move that money into other productive companies, I don't think they'd have any problem with that. So that's the first thing. Now, as far as your question on whether or not you should keep some GE stocks because the price is so low right now, I don't think that that's a great reason to hold on to a company. If that's your only reason because the price is low, there should be more to it than that. You should hold on to GE because you think it's a good investment and it's going to give you a good return over the next five to 10 years. That should be the reason that you hold any of the stock. If you don't believe it's a good investment, you should take that money out and diversify it into other companies that you do think are good investments. There's lots of great companies out there. All the FANG stocks, those are pretty good investments, even at the high valuations that they're at. Then you have lots of payment companies, PayPal and Visa and MasterCard, Square, all these different companies that are expanding and growing right now. You have Johnson & Johnson, you have all the dividend paying companies that I have in my portfolio. There's lots of good companies to pick from. You can go through and pick out a lot of different companies and disperse this money into these different companies. Or if you don't want to worry about that, you can just put it into an ETF. So I would not hold on to GE just because the price has gone down. I would hold on to it if you believe that there's a good reason why the price shouldn't be going down and you think that it will go back up based off of your research. If you don't have any research or any valid reason to think the price is going to go up and GE is going to expand, then I wouldn't stay invested in it. So as far as what I would do is I would probably sell completely out of GE and distribute that money into a diversified portfolio 
of, I think, more relevant blue chip stocks. And I think that, that would be the better decision to do. And I bet you the person that you inherited this from would be happy of that decision. If you took the money and you grew it into more money, I'm sure they'd be happy about that. That's what I'd hope anybody that I'd give some type of inheritance to, I would hope that they would take that money and use it really wisely and even grow it into more money. That'd be the best case scenario. Okay, well, I think I'm going to end it on that question there. I appreciate everybody for tuning in. I will catch you guys next time.